Hey, good morning. Why don't you remain standing with me as I'm going to read uh, from Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 41. While I'm doing that, just so you know, some folks are going to be putting chairs up on the stage, and you will have zero success in listening to me. You'll be watching them the whole time. But let me read nonetheless. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 41. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption." This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footsteps footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is not for you and your children, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. With many other words he bore witnesses and continued to exhort them, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added to that day about 3,000 souls. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning and the opportunity we have to bring glory to your name by recognizing Jesus is the Christ, our Lord, risen from the dead to save us from our sin and death. We pray, God, as we spend time in your word this morning that your word might do to us what it did to that generation, and it would cut us to the heart, and that we might respond in faith and say in kind, what should we do? God, we ask for you to make us more like Jesus even today. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, and uh, my name is Greg. I'm one of the pastors here at FBC. We're glad to have you here. And a little different this morning because we have a panel and a little bit of housekeeping just to let you know. Uh, we have four air conditioners servicing this room. One of them is on break. Uh, it is taking the day off. It gets a union uh, day off every uh, and our air conditioning is like yours. It never breaks in the winter. So we do have them running. And uh, for some of you who normally come to church with a blanket and a parka, uh, you're like, man, this is fantastic. For some of you, you're going, the overflow room is the fireside room, and the air conditioning in there is working great. So uh, sorry about that, uh, but you'll survive. And uh, th there's some disagreement on that. You, you will, in <laughs> fact... Uh, survive. All right, we're going to talk today about uh, mission, and uh, the reason for that is we thought it, we have a lot of mission we do as a, as a church, and we, we thought we should talk about it, not only as what we do as a church, but also what it means for us as individuals, because we had a group of folks go to Costa Rica, we had a vacation Bible school, which is a mission, we also just had a, a group of people come back from Dallas, the, the young adult, or the, the student ministry just came back from Dallas, Texas, and, uh, and Todd is saying, oh, you have, broke, have broken air conditioning, I see that with canceled flights, uh, pests, and lost luggage. Yeah, so, so Todd wins the Bad Day Award uh, for that. So we want to talk about what it means 
for the gospel not only to, to affect our heart, but what does it mean in, in terms of how we engage with others? And you'll see up on the screen uh, a little graphic, which is obviously professionally made. Um, I didn't have my crayon, so I had to use uh, my computer. This is one way of thinking about mission as we apply Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8 says, you will be my witnesses in Judea, you know, the area around Jerusalem, Samaria, a little bit broader area in Israel, and then to the ends of the world. One of the ways we can think about mission is seeing the good news of the gospel in our life influence the places closest to us relationally and geographically, and then applying that in spheres as they work itself out. You think about what does it mean to communicate the gospel to myself? What does it mean to share the good news in my own heart and mind? One teacher said it this way, the person who talks to me the most is me. And maybe we should tell ourselves the truth of the gospel and instead of many of the lies we tell ourselves. We might wonder, what does it mean to share the good news of the gospel in our home? How does that change how we interact with the people in our home? Or in our church, or in our neighborhood, or our place of work, or school, and then even around the world. The way we talk about this at this church is what does mission look like locally, regionally, and globally? And we want to think through these things for you because there's a couple of jobs we're hoping to accomplish this morning with you. Is number one, remind each other, sharing the gospel and being on mission is a part of the thing. That's a, it's a part of being a Christian, is communicating good news that Jesus saves sinners to the people around us, and it's not an optional thing. The second thing we want to remind ourselves is it's right in front of us. That you don't have to go to Costa Rica like Jeff and his team did. You don't have to fly down to Dallas, Texas like the students did. We can think about what does it mean to be on mission with the people in my home? What, is, what does that look like? I can engage in the gospel with the people I know most closely. So uh, the panelists, the esteemed panelists are going to walk us uh, through that. I want to let you know uh, there's going to be a, a phone number up on the screen. I think it's already up there. If you have questions or comments, you can text them to the number that's displayed on the screen. Todd has that telephone in the back, and he is curating those, and uh, he will be sending those up to me in very, uh, various spots during our discussion. Uh, I will bring those questions to our esteemed panelists, and, uh, and we will interact with those. So if there's something you want to think about in regard to mission or questions you have, we would look forward to interacting uh, with you, and if you're watching online, you can participate in that as well. So we have up here uh, Pat Husky, our Director of Women's Ministry, Kylie Jo Flenner, our Director of Children's Ministry. Well, gee, I thought the kids would cheer, Kylie oh, Jo, yeah. but you know, boy, kids, you really... No cheering. No cheering at all. Okay. <laughs> Next week, it's, it, Kids Zone is just a work party. Yeah, Take no them sense. out, and we're doing some weeding. <laughs> all right. And then Jeff Breitler, our Associate Pastor of all the things I don't feel like doing. And... <laughs> which is a lot, which is, which is like associate pastor of missions, among other things, but missions is one of the areas that Jeff presses into uh, quite a bit. So, uh, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. Why don't you share with us some scripture and what the Lord has put on your heart uh, this morning? All right. <clears throat> You're talking about uh, esteemed. Um, there is kind of steam E up here. Uh, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty warm. We've got the lights beating down on us, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so moving through uh, the circles, if we can have those back up uh, on the screen there, um, that's kind of nice to have in front of us. Uh, the idea is that uh, trying to accomplish this morning is to reflect and remind ourselves of uh, God's workmanship in, uh, in a Christian's life. And that's coming out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And uh, so that's, that's a uh, beautiful uh, imagery of God at work. Uh, we are saved um, to do good works. And uh, if you think about that passage, wh what's at work? What is actually taking place in, in our lives? And uh, the first one is just uh, really exciting is uh, that a sinner uh, like myself uh, can be redeemed. That's, that's a good work, that God has that in mind to redeem us, to, to use us, to work through our brokenness and, and, and give us uh, his glory. He's taken us from one state of glory to his glory. And so uh, that's the, uh, the passage um, kind of we're focusing on there. 
So that passage is real familiar, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I'll, I'll read it. Whenever I try to quote it, I get, get it wrong. But we're real familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. And that's a really important uh, biblical truth is we're saved by faith. We just trust God and he saves us. And what I hear you saying is we can't leave verse 10 off of that in that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And uh, so what I'm hearing there is purpose and I, that when we're saved, we're not merely saved for heaven, but that's good, right? I mean, heaven sounds really good, but, but a part of that is between here and there, there's, there's purpose. How have you guys seen that play an important role in the lives of believers you know, that, that fundamental role of purpose? And we have a purpose to, to do good works. And that's, that's more than saying no to naughty things. It's engaging positively in the good news of Christ in the world around us. So how does that purpose influence your life or the lives you've seen others? I think one of the things um, I've seen or experienced also is... Um, when we're working for a purpose, it's less about me. And it's more about who Christ is and what he's doing and how he's doing it. Um, and when you don't have a purpose, it's a lot easier to continue to focus on um, the work that I need for me to feel good <laughs> or right. better. But when I have a purpose, and um, as Todd probably would contest with this last week, and things come up, I can adjust because I know what my purpose is. Um, I may throw a little tantrum, but mm -hmm. eventually I will move through and recognize that there's a bigger purpose. There's something that I'm working towards, um, and, and that always focuses me back on. on so. Another aspect that I think of when I think of God um, having a purpose for me specifically, for all of us individually, is it just gives significance to what is next to come to consider that the God of all creation, the one who holds stars in place, has a purpose for me in what I consider to be just ordinary mundane, uh, gives an entirely new significance to just the ordinary things that he sets in front of me. Good. So that, that purpose element might make us change our perspective. I think, Kylie Joe, you brought up a good point about Todd's mission trip. Not to pick on you, Todd, um, by the way. Um, but when your purpose is mission, which is they were going to Dallas and they were working with young people in South Dallas. And then when flights are canceled and the luggage is lost and you have uh, difficult living conditions, the reason that's sort of a situation you can handle is you say, well, the purpose wasn't to be comfortable. The purpose was to do a thing. That, that creates a different framework for handling the unexpected circumstances. And, and that's one of the things that purpose does in the life of a believer. When things get uncomfortable, and life does get uncomfortable from time to time, and we, it reframes how we approach what ought to be. You say, well, no, I love Jesus. He loves me. I should be comfortable. But mission actually says, no, the mission is not comfort. The mission is how do I accomplish the good work uh, God has given me to do? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. And another layer to this as well is... Um we're all prone to this. Um, if we don't rehearse the gospel to ourselves and remind us of that purpose and that change perspective, what the work is taking place of transform life, we tend to have a default of, boy, I better do something good so I can get God off my back. And um, be careful with that because there's no rest in that. There's no peace in that. You feel like you have to do some kind of charity thing because even a non-believer can do great things. We see that. We see them doing good works. We see them doing great things uh, for the community and the world around us. But what's different for the believer is that uh, the benefits of the work of transformation in my life moves me towards good work that I find rest in. And in addition to that, to, to consider that God has a, pur a purpose for me, for us, helps me to um, be compelled in many ways to discover what that purpose is. Um, I think um, people can say they have plans or, or um, life goals that are set in front of them, but to know that it's God-ordained and God-directed, then it's also God-empowered to accomplish it. 
Good. I'm going to put these guys on the spot now, and this is just for their entertainment. Um, and I'll start. What I, what I want us to do now is, coming out of Ephesians 2.10, he's created us for us good works. I want you to look at one of those spheres, and you get to pick one. Now, I'm going to go first, so that way it gives you a time to think. You won't be listening to me. It's fine. I'm going to start with self. So I want you to, to help us think through what are some relatively specific ways tangible ways that we can apply. What does it mean for my purpose as one created for good works to show up in this particular sphere? And I'm going to start uh, with self. And I mentioned it already. Uh, one, of the, one of the people we talk to the most is ourselves. So one of the things we uh, can do as Christians is tell ourselves the truth of the, of the gospel instead of listening to the, to the lies that tend to repeat. And Jeff sort of mentioned one already. You might think, maybe, you, maybe you've blown it this week, you did something sinful, and by maybe I mean since, um, and you might tell yourself something about that reality. You might say, since I this, did this, thought this, felt this, therefore, as like Jeff might have said, I need to do something else to get God off my back. Now, what we call that in theological circles is heresy. That's what we call that. What got God off our back? The right, the right answer in church is Jesus. Come on. Jesus. I don't do hard questions. Jesus got God off our back. So if I sin, I don't need to get God off my back. Jesus already did that. I need to tell myself a couple of pieces of information as a, an act of faith in God. Number one, God's still cool with me. He's still good with me because I trust him. He's, he's good with me. Secondly, I need to tell myself some, some truth, though. That sin was not as good as I thought it was going to be. And it's, it's a participation in deadly stuff that didn't do for me what I thought it would, and now it's filling my life with uh, things I don't want in my life. So it, it might be good news to tell yourself, that's not what you want. Because if you're... If your spouse or your coworker or your buddy says that's not what you want, you're going to tell them to shut up. Kids, don't say that. I forgot Kids Zone is in here. I keep forgetting. Kids, that's, don't say that. Say, please be quiet. Um, but if you say it to yourself, you say, you know what? That was, that was wrong. Knock it off. And maybe we can hear that. That's a good word. Telling, exhorting our own heart. That can be an act of communicating the gospel. And I need to be able to share the gospel with myself because that's where I'm going to be able to share it with others. Have I yammered on long enough for you guys to have your pat is ready to go? I am because I want to You don't get, get to take mine. I took self. I get to get the next circle, though. Okay, good. Go home. ahead. I was afraid y'all were going to jump into it, so I wanted to make sure I got it first. Because I think home, for me personally, may not, maybe no one else in this room, but sometimes the hardest place for me to have good works and to... And to live the purpose God has for me is in my home. That's the easiest place for me to respond, to react, to get tired, to allow all those things that the dust that the world brings in comes into home. And the, the privilege and the joy of being family is that we live together through those things. And I think it helps us to understand God has a purpose. He's intentionally put us in this small little nuclear family so that we can live out what it means to forgive and be forgiven, mm. to um, blow it, <laughs> and um, to come back and know that you can but still love and be loved. And so it's in the home that I think sometimes um, we are one, uh, we tend to be a little bit more transparent and more vulnerable, hence strife and struggle can be a little bit more tangible. So for me, the, um, really the rubber meeting the road is at home, learning to allow Christ to love through me when times aren't going easily and to forgive and be forgiven. Good. Sorry, I'm going to take the next one. Um, <laughs> I'm going to skip church but, um, and talk about community. Um, and and I, without jumping in and repeating what um, to share uh, when, it, when it's my section, but um, community is something often, if I want to work or help the community, I've worked in, in businesses and stuff, and we do commun community services. Anyone can do that. Um, but, but my perspective is I'm in community or the community, the Rogue Valley or wherever, when I'm grocery shopping 
or when I am um, going to a movie or when I'm, and um, for me, the realization is um, I need to bring mission into that. That doesn't mean I'm handing out tracts or, you know, always sharing scripture. Uh, that could happen. But it also means, um, I think we talked about this in our um, time on Tuesday, like I want to live in a world where, I want to live in a world where when I'm grocery shopping and I notice there's a person that is a little older and maybe not as tall, is reaching for something, can't reach it, I'm going to go out of my way and help them out not motivated by anything other than that is a way to be on mission. Um, I don't need to do that. <laughs> um, it's my time. I'm not ministering at the church. But the reality is that is also just as much as community as when I go out and serve in the community, serve in BBS, do those things which are community focused. But I can be community focused when I'm out about my life. And I think for me, um, and for us as a culture, we tend to think in the idea of uh, work or home life and then out life. And we're checked in one and we're signed out of another. But the reality is this mission happens wherever we go. Um, and, and so um, being intentional about those things in our community. Good. And we really appreciate what Jeff has to say, and we're not going to hear it. Um, <laughs> there's just no time. Uh, get to a couple of questions, and then we're going... No, I'm serious. You know, I'm sure it was brilliant and, and epic. So. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's fantastic. See, look at you being on mission. I love Jesus so much. Good for you. All right. Someone, that, someone has asked via text, um, what are ways we can balance the time and our mission in various circles of influence? It's a fantastic question because we haven't covered them in a lot of detail. The idea here is just where are you right now? That's the idea. The idea isn't creating a flow chart. I need to be in all these circles all the time. The idea of thinking about spheres of influence is merely to make mission accessible. The question is this, where am I today? Am I in my home today? Then I want to approach my engagement in my home on mission. Maybe today I'm in my community or I'm at work or I'm at school. The, the idea here is saying mission is something that is where am I? And, and the spheres is just a way of thinking about the places we end up. And it's not so much about time, it's more about a question of, I want to work, uh, I want God to do work, work on my heart that wherever I am, my purpose has followed me. That's, that's the idea between, uh, behind thinking through those uh, spheres uh, of influence. Uh, Pat, we're going to turn it over to you for a few minutes. Thanks, Jeff. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm great. Okay, good. Go ahead, Pat. Well, when we think about God having a purpose for us and the good works that he has planned for us to do beforehand, um, it's hard for me not to be reminded that I can't do any of those things on my own, that unless Christ is doing it in me and through me, then it's, it's a clanging bell is the way Paul talks about it. And um, the scripture is very clear. Both Paul and Peter spent a lot of time in their epistles talking about the spiritual gifts, the importance of... Um, working under the power and through the um, the unction, if you will, the way old King James says, the Holy Spirit's power. And so in these passages of scripture, scripture, both that Paul and Peter have written, we learn as believers that spiritual gifts are, are not only important, they're absolutely essential for not only living the life that God has called us to, but living growing in our in our walk with him as well as in community be it in our home or in our church or in our work or in the community wherever it goes and so I've just put together a couple of the passages that both Peter and Paul have written about what it means to function as a body of believers using our spiritual gifts first Corinthians chapter 12 says just as a body though one has uh, just as a body though one has many parts all its parts form only one body, so it is with Christ. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but only one body. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And then he goes on, Paul goes on to say in Ephesians, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So Christ gave apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip his people 
for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. From Christ, the whole body is joined and held together, supporting and growing and building each other up in love as each one does his part. And then Peter sums up spiritual gifts by saying, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's love in its various forms. When I think about spiritual gifts and the importance that both the scripture places on it and quite frankly, Christ himself, apart from him, we can do nothing. And so it's by the um, indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we are able to do anything, even to understand scripture. Um, as I think about how God has placed us intentionally in the body of Christ and has specifically gifted us to do those good works that he planned beforehand for us to do, has given us his spirit to have eyes to see what needs to be done and the heart and the unction to do it. I'm reminded personally of a time that even now looking back on it 20 years later, it still humbles me to, remind, to be reminded of how um, God's gifts are not just intended for us personally, for our own personal consumption, but quite frankly, he's gifted us for each other. And uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, when I was first hired into this position here at FBC, um, I uh, was overwhelmed with the privilege and the, um, and the stewardship that God had entrusted to me. I remember one specific day, uh, I had been on the job a couple of months, and there was a networking time at Applebee's for women in ministry here in the Rogue Valley. And so I went to that lunch, and I was reminded once again how unqualified <laughs> and untrained I was to do this position. And just driving from Applebee's down Biddle to McAndrews to the church, I remember sitting at the corner of McAndrews and uh, Biddle. The light was red, and I was once again rehearsing all the reasons I shouldn't be used by God in this position. As the uh, thoughts and, and fears were, were swirling in my mind, I, I didn't even have time to, to vocalize the prayer that I had been praying for months, um, asking God why and how could he use me. And just in that split second, as only the Spirit of God can do, he dropped into my heart very sweetly but very impact and, uh, powerfully that I was God's gift to the women of FBC. 20 years later, I'm still untrained, I'm still unqualified, but God has taught me that it's, it's, his, ministry, it's his ministry, it's his service, it's his empowerment, and it's his work to be done. And he takes the unqualified and the untrained. He takes the foolish things of this world. He takes uh, ordinary vessels to do his work. And so in these 20 years, God has given me a capacity to love like I didn't think I could ever love the women of this church. He's given me a deep desire to encourage every woman to grow, to know Jesus Christ and to love him more deeply every day, to walk in those things that God has called him to do. And one of the greatest privileges of not only being a part of staff here at FBC, but being a member here at FBC has been the privilege of seeing how God has worked in the lives of his people here at our church. We have the privilege of decades of um, service that God's people have done both here in our facility as well as outside in the community. And the uh, encouragement that God has given us, we come every Sunday to worship together so that we can go out and worship in service wherever we go. And I can't help but just take a minute to just remember what I know I have witnessed in the years that I have been here at FBC of how he's worked through you, not only to touch my life, because you are a gift to me. Um, God has equipped our church with pastoral leadership and elders who, who have encouraged and empowered us um, to do the work of ministry. And I can just look back and I think about how kids have been impacted through the ministry here at FBC, through Awana, through um, the opportunities that are given through Kids Zone to raise up these children to know Jesus Christ and to, to grow in them. But the ministry isn't just here in Kids Zone or in the gym for Awana, but it's with all of us as, 
as adults who go out into the community. Some are, are school teachers, some are teaching at home, some of you are working in Good News Clubs, some of you have spent years just investing in the lives of your neighborhood children. Those are God's gift, that's mission that God has called us to and equipped us to do. But it's not just with the kids. Our students have been impacted for generations here at, at FBC, not just by being exposed to and equipped by knowing the word of God and, and being challenged to rehearse the gospel every day, but we have seen the, the privilege that it's been for our young people to grow up in an environment that examples for them working in accordance to God's call for their life through the gift that God has given them. And it's not, again, it's not just done here in the confines of First Baptist Church. Our youth have been scattered out into our community and wherever they've gone, they have carried the message of Jesus Christ. We have, we have volunteers who serve not only here at the church, but out in, in community opportunities of ministry that can only be building up and equipping the body of Christ in students' lives as they grow to become adults. And then I think about the adult ministry and, and how, like all the other ministries, it's not just ministry that's done here at 649 Crater Lake Avenue. It's adults who come here are encouraged and uh, reminded of the gospel that they have been called to go out and the adult ministries that have taken place. Even in this last week, the, the mission that you have done in this last week, only in eternity will we ever really be able to see how God has worked and touched lives through us because we're intentional in doing that. But one of the other opportunities that we as a church have had is we have so many of you that God has called and laid on your heart to be involved in mission uh, outside of FBC um, sh formally. One of the uh, examples that comes to my mind, and it's only a few in your bulletin, there's a list of the various community um, ministries that are represented by you in our church. One of them uh, that just comes to my mind is Salvation Army. We've had an opportunity to partner with Sh Salvation Army because Ken Pond serves on the advisory board for Salvation Army, and through his involvement, we as a church can join in praying for and supporting what's being done at Salvation Army, and that's just one of many ministries that you are involved in because God has laid it on your heart and called you to do that. Um, Salvation Army specifically, Jeff will be working with us um, come closer to the Christmas season, that we can join in with Salvation Army and ring bells um, so that an opportunity once again that just we can be a presence uh, Jesus said, um, even in the scriptures, he says, if you don't believe the words I say, see the work that I'm doing and give God praise for that. And I think that's the privilege that God has given us as a body. So I'm privileged to be a part of a, of a church that has not just taught me to, um, to love Jesus, but has encouraged me to serve his people. And what a privilege it's been. So, uh, for extra credit, um, I don't know if how we give out the extra credit, um, but anyway, you get a gold star, um, and you claim that from the gold star booth out front. Uh, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, those uh, passages, those chapters, I don't know what verses, I just learned, I'm good enough if I know where it's at chapter-wise, right? Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, two places where the Bible talks a lot about spiritual gifts, meaning... Ways in which God has gifted you as a believer individually in a, in a particular way. Uh, and we mentioned some from Ephesians, pastors, teachers, uh, prophets, evangelists. But there are many others. There's encouragement, there's hospitality, there's administration, there's uh, acts of service, uh, there's generosity. There's many ways in which the, the Holy Spirit works as, on us in particular. And one person was curious, how do we know what that is in my life? And I was wondering if just... One or two of you, whoever wants to jump in first, can tell us, what are the ways in which you've helped people understand, well, this is a way that God has, has gifted me, and how do we encourage and help that in people's lives? Who wants to take that one? You guys are looking at me. All right. So, uh, so thanks, Jeff, for sharing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. It's going by fast, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'll take you to one unique story. This, I'll never forget this one when I was working in high school at uh, Pappy's uh, Pizza, now they're Abby's. And there was a guy that came in every uh, uh, Monday night and he wanted a mini pepperoni pizza. One time he grabbed my arm as I was turning back to go to the kitchen 
And he goes, um, you know, there's something different about you. And uh, I just kind of played it off. It's like, yeah, um, I don't know what you're talking about. No, no, there's something different about you. And uh, I knew where he was going. I said, well, I think I, I got an idea where you're going with this. Um, um, I believe in Jesus. I knew it. I knew it. I knew you were one of those people. <laughs> and I just, I'm not sure where he went with that for the rest of his life. But um, at that time in my life, I was uh, just, um, I'm not quite sure how people saw me, but uh, I love Jesus. It was pretty cool. Yeah. So one of the ways we see our gifts showing up, and that, that is one of your gifts, Jeff, is encouragement. And we all know this. If you spent time with Jeff, you figured that out pretty quick. And it's one of the ways we identify those gifts is when, when sort of people might comment on it. Mm -hmm. Say, man, when, when I come over to your house, I feel like I've gone to a resort. Everything's handled. So you might have the gift of hospitality, right? And, and so one of the ways we might identify, and usually what, when people like Jeff might say, I don't understand, it doesn't seem like a gift. I'm just doing what I do. Well, that, that's the way spiritual gifts are. The Holy Spirit uses how God has made us to really be effective in, in sharing the gospel, and that's, that's part of it. Okay, one more. You both want to go, so you'll have to thumb wrestle for it. Or, no. Well, I, one of the um, ways is, is, is that we think, oh, well, I have to know my gifts so I know where to serve. But I think sometimes that's backwards. you right. you got to serve, and you'll know real quick that the nursery is not the place for you. Right. However, if it is, I'm looking, no, just kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the answer but, is you are gifted. Yeah, yeah, no, this yeah, is where you Yeah, you are gifted. Belong. No, but the reality is you don't know sometimes till you get in there and then the Lord goes and he gives you this gift that you didn't even know was a thing. And, uh, or maybe it's a gift for a season or, or for a time. Um, but you don't know unless you serve. And so I think sometimes some of us that don't like to get out of our comfort zone uh, use that as a great excuse. Well, I don't have the gift of, so I'm waiting until right. the right thing comes along. Well, there's not many people who have a gift of organizing or straightening the chairs, but we need people to organize and straighten the chairs, and you do it, and, and God's going to bless you through that, and sometimes he's going to reveal the encouragement gift through that. Or, or, or in serving in ministry with women's ministry, he's going to introduce you that you have the gift of hospitality. Right. So I think that that is often a missed way to identify. Right. So gift. that's another great way to understand your spiritual gift. And I don't know how to say this politely. Well, because I'm not polite. I have the gift of <laughs> exhortation, unlike Jeff. Um, maybe something annoys you. Like you mentioned, you come in and the chairs aren't straight. Or you come in and the coffee is not warm. Or you come in and something. It could be that's an area of gifting in your life. And that's why you tend to notice those things. And really, the biblical answer is then, then get after it. We're a body of believers. There isn't a guy you email. We are that guy. That we're the person. And, and if there is something God has put on your heart, it could be because, uh, because of, of, uh, of your gifting. Um, okay, uh, let me see. I think there was one other question. I may want to do it later. Um, hold on. Yeah, we'll do it a little bit later. Um, let me just add to that. Here's, here's what I always tell people, too, as a way, just a short way of knowing how to know your spiritual gift. Number one, know God. You should know the guy who gifts you. Uh, so know God. How do you know God? Read your Bible. Uh, you know, so that's sort of my first question to somebody is, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. When was the last time you read your Bible? Uh, because the God of the Bible is the one who's gifting you. I would, that's going to be something we're going uh, to need to know. And finally, uh, get busy. And so you can jump in and volunteer somewhere, go to somewhere in your community, engage in what God has called you to do, and you're going to know real quickly whether or not that's your gifting uh, or not. Now, it doesn't mean everything's going to go great. Uh, what it does mean, though, is you are going to see God working in powerful ways even when things uh, are difficult. So that's a short answer is know God, know your Bible, and get busy. It, I, I would say it nicely this way, and nicely I mean rudely. If you're not busy, you will never discover your spiritual gift. If, if you're not engaging in the mission in your, in your home or in your community or in your church, you're going to sit. That's how most people discover their spiritual gift is they do something and somebody comes up to them and says, wow, that really encouraged me. I really saw God working in you through that, that work you did, that hospitality you showed, that, um, that kind of thing. So uh, there's no short answer. You've got to get after it. All right, I'm going to let... Um, 
Who's up next? Kylie Joe. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so when looking or thinking about this subject, I um, immediately went to um, my life verse, and it's Acts 20:24. 20, um, this is Paul talking to the Ephesian elders, but um, it really, I mean, it applies to all of us. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. When I first came across, and by that means, kind of that verse jumped out at me, I was a high school student here at FBC, um, a product of very um, blessed to be here in a, in a church that loved and cared for me and my family. And I experienced um, what I think a lot of the Costa Rica mission strip people are experiencing. I discovered uh, international missions. Um, I got to go on several mission trips, and I loved it. And my, this became my life first when I was asking for support, when I was going around. I was sharing that the task of testifying the good news of God's grace. I'd planned on going to Multnomah to major in international studies. But one of the things I didn't recognize, or I recognized but I didn't put the value in, is not only when you do an international missions, or you go to a different state, or you get out of your community to do missions, it's not only blessing those you're serving, but it changes your perspective. And it's something that changed my perspective as a high school student and has changed since, realizing that my task of testifying the good news of the gospel um, can happen anywhere, but primarily it changed my perspective and how I view other people. When you get outside of your zone, <laughs> um, you see how other people live and maybe not so comfortably, um, it really helps you look at people differently. And I tri attribute that the Lord really got a hold of me and said, KJ, people need my love, no matter who they are and where they are. Um, so, so that perspective change um, really started to affect how I viewed mission. Um, and, and then the Lord led me not to international missions. I still love going on mission trip and have um, a heart for that, always will. But it realized that, it made me realize that the task the Lord has given me, it's the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. I should be doing that everywhere I go. Um, and we talked a little bit about it with those fears. Um, and, and, I used to have a term <laughs> when I was in my college years and early 20s um, where I'd say, well, I have a money job and I have a church job or a ministry job. I always had two. That was my deal. Um, I had those two things. But it was a realization that that's not actually a correct way to say. Um, I think the way we talked about it um, that I really liked is there was the sec sacred versus the secular, right? I had to, I had to pay the bills. I'd eat dinner, you know. Um, but somewhere along the line, the Lord revealed that I can still testify God's good news at my job, no matter my money job or my ministry job. Um, and that became um, another ministry focus for me. And so just to give you a quick story, um, one of the ways uh, that that changed is I would pray for the people that were I was working with that day in the car before I got out, which sometimes was 4 o'clock because it was at Starbucks when I started doing this. So, but I would just pray. I would pray for them. Um, it's a lot harder to be irritated with somebody when you've already prayed for them, just so you know. <laughs> Little tip helps you out. Um, and it started to blur those lines between ministry job and money job. And um, my last store that I was managing um, in, for Starbucks, um, I had an assistant manager come in, and I've asked if I could share this story. Um, she came in as a very broken individual. Um, she had just attempted to, to take her life and relapsed into alcoholism, and she was coming back from that. Um, and in comes this very broken person. Um, her name was Jana, and um, we clicked immediately. Uh, she has got the best sense of humor, and I don't think I've laughed more in a job than I did. Um, but my job was not only to be her manager, but to just love, just to love on her. Um, and one of the things I purposed to do um, was to not, not talk about what I did. And often we would have our touch bases on Monday mornings. Hey, how was your weekend? What'd you do? And I would just share. Well, I worked with the, the kids, and here's a funny story, and it would go on. 
So pretty much every Monday for a year, I would let her know that she's welcome to come to church well, as well. Um, and the Lord has a way of working because he brought another individual to our um, little family store, um, a sassy lady by the name of Susie who loved the Lord. Um, and Jana really got along well with her. Um, but long story short, Jana ended up showing up at church one Sunday. And um, by no, um, by, not by me, <laughs> not, by J- not by Susie or anyone else in the store that knew and loved Jesus, but by the Lord, being who he was and faithful, Jana came to know the Lord um, powerfully. It didn't solve all her problems. She learned that the hard way. Um, but what it did is I got to see firsthand what living mission in your job looked like, taking and loving the broken person and, um, and being able to, uh, to just be consistent in their lives, to show a different kind of love. Like Jeff said with that guy, there's something different about you. Um, and the beauty is she is now a... Um, a director, her and Susie have started a ministry called Omega Ministries in Portland. And she goes around um, and has a group of women that come who have come out of hard situations like Jana had, either alcoholism, drugs, homelessness, um, prison. And she gets them connected in with other Christian coffee shops and they mentor these women, show them Jesus and teach them practical things. And I get to say, I get to stand back and go, Lord, (laughs) you didn't do this while I was working 50 million hours at all the churches that I've worked at in all of my life. You didn't do this. You did this because we showed up as a Starbucks store. We were silly. We were laughed. We were real. We were upset. We talked. We were real. We showed God's love. And here this gal is making a community change for the kingdom. And I just, um, I'm more proud of that, (laughs) of where she is, than I could imagine. I think one of my proudest moments was when she first came to know the Lord, Jenna's like, well, there is no way I'm ever praying out loud. (laughs) She's like, that is not for me. And I was like, nope, you will. She's, no, nope, not going to happen. Well, once I moved back here, I got a call, and Jenna says, I have to tell you what I'm doing. I said, what are you doing, Jenna? She goes, I'm participating in the 24-hour prayer women's group at the church, and I'm leading it. (laughs) I said, huh, is this where I get to say, I told you so, Jana? Um, But it's those things that that could be missed if I were to continue, if we were to continue to look at life and say, this is my job where I make money, this is where I do service, this is my community, this is my home, this is my me time. Then it would be missed. But if you stop and you recognize that our purpose to testify God's good news can happen anywhere you are, and it's just that intention of doing that. And that's really the, the aspect that I um, want to focus on. And the last um, bit is, now I look at that as my purpose. Um, and some of you may say, well, I'm not working anymore. I'm retired. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I have this ministry? Um, and... Uh, my mom comes to mind. Um, My mom, who was a teacher forever, um, her mission was kids. Share the gospel with kids. We could not go anywhere in this valley without somebody from 6'2 to um, knee high giving my mom a hug because they'd had Mrs. Flenner as a teacher. That was taken from her due to her health. And a lot of people probably don't know, you know, that's hard when you have your passion taken away. But Because of Pat and men's ministry, my mom discovered a whole new ministry. She loved the women here. I know how much she prayed and loved. However, the other part that I don't know, if you don't realize, my mom understood this verse. She looked at every hospital, every doctor's appointment, every nurse, every CNA, every person that she encountered with my dad and I in tow as her mission. We were in the hospital. She's deathly ill. She can't breathe. She is asking that nurse how they're doing and praying for them and talking about their lives and treating them like people. And that is something we can all do. And um, to me, that's what this verse means. And that's why this was one of her life verses as well. Um, so that's to say that we, we like to have excuses, but 
there isn't when it comes to testifying the good news of God. So. It's fantastic. And one of, the, one of the folks who wrote in wondered, what is the difference then in engaging in mission with intention in our regular life, at work and home and around, around wherever we are? What's the difference between that and just merely, I don't mean that negatively, but merely being a decent human? You know, so uh, we want to live in a place where the world's a nice place to live in. We want to be a part of that. What, it, what is different for the believer where that intentionality also moves it into engaging with the good news of the gospel? Kali Joe, you don't have to answer that. You're welcome to, but if anybody else wants to jump in, what, what shifts it from merely being a decent person? Um, you know, because like we said, you know, uh, nobody's going to get into heaven because the person in front of them bought them coffee. There, there is a propositional truth to the gospel. So how do we, what is the difference there between just being a good person, a decent human in our community, and being intentional about engaging in mission? Only one of you gets to go. So again, you have to thumb wrestle or something. I don't know. We just... Okay, I have it up. Go ahead. Yeah. The, um, I, I keep thinking about the, the fact that last Sunday, you just kind of flippantly said that that old bracelet, what would Jesus do? I think the world wants to do things replicating good things. But as a believer, our motivation is not just to tell some, to communicate that we love them because we're getting a, something from the high, high counter, but somewhere deep in our heart, we're knowing that that's a person that Jesus loves. Right. And right. so we can love them through them. Sometimes it, it's words and sometimes we're just planting a seed or even, even just furrowing a, a, a row, but we're doing it because Jesus first has done it for us. And we're just overflowing with, with who he is and what he's done on our behalf. And I pray that at some point we'll just do it naturally. It won't even be something that I'm doing intentionally. It's just I see somebody that needs, that needs encouragement and love and just do it because that's what Jesus would do. And he would do it not so that it would show, a, show focus attention on himself, but so that they would see his father. Okay, we good. do it in the other way. So, so they see Jesus. So it begins with a relational connection. Yeah. Many times, not always. Sometimes we'll share it with the gospel with a perfect stranger. But many times, having the opportunity to share the good news of what Jesus has done for us begins with a, a relational connection. In the workplace, what's hard about that, and in the home, is it means they see both the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. So sometimes at work, uh, you may be, well, I can't share the gospel. They know I've said bad words, or they know I lose my temper. Well, good. Now they know Jesus had to save you from something. So that's not a mystery. Jesus had to save me from sin. They know you're a sinner because you, you work with them. It, uh, the imperfection of our life doesn't inhibit the gospel. But if we can build that relational connection, it gives us an opportunity for the gospel. And that's, you really want to say something. Well, so Kylie just to, to reaffirm that, I think one of the, the ways that can be impactful um, is when you do mess up. <laughs> uh, and so I, I remember a time or two where I would have said something that was not appropriate or maybe was gossiping, and I know they don't care that I gossip, but it was a, it was a conviction for me, and I had to go back and say, you know, guys, I'm so sorry I should not talk about that person like that. And they kind of look at you like, well, that's not a big deal. I'm like, I, I know it's not a big deal to you, but I, I want to show love to everybody. So I, I'm sorry for that. I don't make a big deal out of it and lament, but, but purely sometimes admitting that we, we can make mistakes and be sinners yeah. is just as impactful Good. as the words that we use in, the, you know, in this Yeah, gospel. actually, if we've really profoundly experienced the grace of Christ, it gives us the ability to confess sin more easily because we don't have to carry the shame for it. Jeff, I want to give you an opportunity because you have just had, come back from Costa Rica and help us think through... Maybe as a body of Christ, maybe even as individuals, what is that part of the part of that sphere is the world, and how do we think about mission globally? As the passage you indicated, Ephesians two ten, we have good works to do, and Jesus calls us to reach the whole world. How do you see us engaging in that, and what does that look like for us as individuals? Yeah, this is you, you can start to see the theme of the sphere of uh, influences here through the circles. And then it reaches out to, to the global perspective as well, to the world. And uh, what I love about it is that once we first, again, rehearse and recognize the good work that God has done through Jesus Christ in our life, it just moves towards the world. In fact, there's a command in Matthew 28, 17 through 20, 
And when they saw him, they worshiped him. They're responding, they're worshiping because of this good news uh, that there is a rescuer for the sinner. I love that. If you just take a moment to pause and recognize the actual work that God has done in your life, that a wretched sinner as an individual person, we can actually be redeemed and have changed perspective with a purpose to be part of God's global work. And it moves them on to this, that Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I love that ending too. He is with us. And so there is great benefit to the world uh, because we're saved to um, do good works. Again, not because of obligation, not because of duty, but simply to the fact that change perspective. So what does that look like when we went to Costa Rica? I have a few slides um, that will come up here. This is a great benefit to uh, the community of Costa Rica. First of all, our purpose was to go alongside and encourage Paul and Bridget Abbott, the missionaries there in Costa Rica. They're working at a, uh, a community center there that is a hub for all the ministries that go out uh, from doing projects to working with kids. And uh, the main role there for Paul is that he's taking care of the facility as a caretaker. And so he's handy with his hands. So that's a good gift that he has. And, uh, and Bridget there, she's working through uh, some ministries there as uh, kind of like what CEF does here locally. I don't know if you've heard of good news clubs in schools and public schools around here in the Rogue Valley. That's what Bridget's doing there. She goes into... Um, uh, neighborhoods and communities and also works with the school and we were able to as a team uh, be a benefit to Bridget to be able to come and help in with the snacks and and play the games and and even though we are not really good with our Spanish um, just our presence in benefiting what Paul and Bridget are doing there um, is a great help for them it's beautiful because it's Paul and Bridget that has the relationships with the people it's Paul and Bridget that has the opportunity to share the gospel, to do the command here where they can disciple and share about Jesus Christ. They can do the baptism work, and we can come for a week and just come and partner and encourage. So the next slide up here. Some of the projects that we've done, uh, we were part of a retaining wall project next to the shop. Um, there were no seeing with the, uh, the torrential rain and flash flooding that they have that the soil moves. And so it was eroding the uh, foundation there next to the shop. So they were uh, creating a, a trench with a retaining wall that holds the soil together. And uh, so you have a picture there. We also have some gals that worked on a project for Paul. He built that bed frame. So the headboard, footboard, and the gals came in with their creative design and did some painting. Next slide. And then we also had a bridge project as well. Uh, these bridges connect the communities with the indigenous people. They uh, live off their farms and uh, grow crops and uh, have uh, livestock, and they have to use these bridges to get across uh, the many rivers that run through the territory. And uh, some of them are in despair. And the one that we worked on here was to replace the skirting on the, uh, the bridge. And often uh, uh, we'd be working there and have the community walking through, and we would uh, say, uh, Buenos dias and say hi and encourage them and then uh, one guy came with his motorcycle across that bridge So if you can see that bridge there in the background, it's a uh, suspension bridge So we're just kind of hanging on the side while he comes across with his motorcycle and his dog and uh, And sometimes they have uh, passengers with them and uh, that was exciting The other benefit too is benefiting the dental clinic there in Costa Rica. You see Ruth there. She's uh, one of the assistants there in the uh, community, and many of you benefit them as well because you brought in dental supplies. So we took all the uh, toothbrushes and toothpastes, toothpastes, <laughs> toothpaste, and uh, some toys that they gave out, and we want to thank you guys for uh, helping with that as well. Next slide. And then we also participated in a uh, soccer event. There's a, uh, a gentleman there that designed this. Um, uh, soccer program that reaches out to kids, so it would be comparable to our uh, Kids Unlimited or uh, 71.5 uh, Kids Ministry, where they uh, reach the community and kids from the community come in. Bridget shows up there and shares um, 
uh, a Bible story with them, and then they go out and play soccer, and the same thing with the school, after-school program. So some of our team was able to uh, play, not with the kids, but some of the, uh, the other uh, young adults there, and uh, we lost. Let's just say that we're not, not really good at soccer, but that's okay. We ate the food afterwards, and that yeah. was victory right there. You Next your, slide. did your best. And that's us as a team. So again, thank you so much for uh, praying for us. We're going to have the team just stand up where they're at, because I want to identify them. So go ahead, Team Costa Rica, stand up. They have these uh, kind of awesome, wonderful shirts. Yeah. And so the reason I have them standing up, so just kind of look around, take a good look. Um, I want to invite you. I know it's awkward, but just work through the awkwardness, okay? That's gospel work, work through awkward. Uh, approach them because their perspective has changed. Just being there for a week is exactly what we're talking about here, is that in that sphere of being in the world, their perspective has changed. I encourage you, invite you to ask them, so what was some of your uh, changed perspective in regards to Costa Rica? Good. You guys can sit down. Thanks. Yeah, and you're wondering, how, how do I engage in, in global mission? Number one is, is obviously the mo most important thing is to be praying. We have a number of missions groups, both locally, regionally, and globally, that we participate with through prayer and financial support. One of the best ways to get that information is go to our website. We have a missions tab, and you can look at the different places we're engaging with others in ministry around the world. And if you want more information, those mission uh, missionaries and in Taiwan and other places all over the world would love for you to email them and say, hey, keep me posted. Most of those folks send out monthly uh, prayer requests. They tell us most of the time we're not supposed to post those on social media. So we receive those and we'll print them in the lobby, but we can't put them on our Facebook page or on our, on our website for a number of, of reasons. So number one is praying. Uh, secondly, uh, you may have the spiritual gift of generosity. So when you hear of students and others getting ready to go overseas, you might have the spiritual gift of writing a check. There's nothing wrong with that. I would say, though, be sure to follow that up with prayer, support, and, uh, and then pray. And then finally, though, you may be uh, called to engage more particularly. Maybe there is a team getting put together, and you say, you know what, it's time for me to maybe have my perspective change uh, by, by going uh, and thinking uh, globally. It's a wonderful opportunity Arbor Church has had for many, many years to engage with the gospel ministry uh, around the world. All right, we are going to uh, wrap it up, and what I want to do is, um, did I cover everything? Am I missing something? Jeff's like, no, we're done. Get us off this hot stage. Um, let me just double check here. Okay, good. I want to, uh, let's stand up. I'm going to read uh, one last passage. We'll stand up and pray, and then uh, we'll be uh, dismissed. Um, so I want to read 1 Peter 3.15 as a way of exhorting our own hearts and uh, being challenged in the gospel. But in your hearts, honor, the Christ, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so God calls us always, number one, to have hope in us. And then when people say, why do you, like Jeff at, at Pappy's, uh, so what's different? Why do you have hope? And we can answer, it's Jesus, all day, every day. God, we thank you for the opportunity you have given us to have purpose. Many of us, uh, before we met you, might have characterized our life as empty, maybe even despair. But because of the gospel in our lives, you give us purpose. You give us calling. Each of us as an individual has a particular role to play in the mission of God working through the body of Christ. I pray, God, that every one of us would, would disregard the lies of the devil who tells us we don't measure up and we don't have a role to play. God, I also pray that you would soften our hard hearts, that we have uh, determined our life as we see it is more important than the mission you have called us to. God, we pray that you would help us to see how we can be engaged in the work of the gospel in the places we already find ourselves. When we're at home, when we're at work, when we're at school, and when we're in our community, we can go there with the intention of bringing hope. We thank you for Jesus. We can't wait till he returns. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's thank our panel. Thank you, guys. God bless. You're dismissed. We'll see you next week.